Well, good evening and welcome to our Tuesday Bible study. Let us begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the blessings of this day, the showers that fell upon our earth, God, and nourished our ground and refilled it and replenished it again for the purposes of the growth that is to come this spring. We give you thanks that you continue to do the same in our lives as well. So again, refresh us with your heavenly water that we might be fed and nourished for our future walk with you. For you ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, I'm so glad that you came today. We are, we're looking at a really complex lesson today from 1 Corinthians. Paul is, again, if you might remember last week, we were, we were looking at a thing called resurrection, which is kind of the cornerstone of our Christian faith. If there is no resurrection, Paul, that Paul says then, you know, we're of all people to be most pitied because honestly, this is the crux of everything. If there is no resurrection, then what is Christianity? Okay? And ultimately, he was talking about that we too will one day be resurrected. Well, we miss a little bit of the section of this between uh, last week's lesson and today's lesson that is edited out of our lectionary. But uh, actually, and I, I'm kind of disappointed about it, and sometime maybe we'll get the opportunity to do it. He talks, he compares uh, the first Adam. You know, he starts using this language of the first Adam, Adam and Eve, and then, of course, the second Adam, which is Jesus Christ, and how this one got it all wrong, and this one got it all right, basically, through one person, this one, death came to everyone, through this one, life came to everyone, because of what Christ has done, and now we have hope in the resurrection. It's really a powerful section, but then he gets into the section about uh, death and resurrection, where he starts comparing our bodies to like a seed. So I want you to hear that. This body, this physical body, is a seed that is planted in the ground. And here we are talking about the waters nourishing the ground and preparing it for the, 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 the farmers who will be planting the spring and something comes up. Um, and so then that seed grows into something. And he's saying that basically that's what happens with this body of ours. This body is a seed. And by the time we're done and we get to the resurrection, the seed is gone, but there's something brand new in its place. There's a, a fruit that's, that's, that's worthy of, of the kingdom of heaven. And so with that in mind, so that's kind of a summary of it. Uh, but let's take a look at this and kind of work through Paul's twisted mind and how he does this. And so we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 15, pardon me, verse 35. And so again, riffing on resurrection, he says, some of you will ask. So Paul is, Paul is again, he's a rabbi, right? He's from this Jewish, rabbinic, pharisaical tradition. And so this was just a very common way in which they would argue. They would think of all the... Uh, objections that people might have to what he's saying, again, about resurrection. And remember, he's talking to a, a mixed group of people. He's talking to some Jews who, who are like, yeah, I'm a follower of Christ because he's a nice guy. He's a rabbi. He had some good things to say. But Jesus, again, and, but Paul is saying, you know, yeah, but if there's no death and resurrection, then Jesus just being a nice guy, so what? There's got to be more than this. The whole point of Jesus, death, resurrection. So he's trying to confront those who would object to what? Well, let's see what the objection would be. Let's see if we can figure this out. Some of you will ask, how can the dead be raised? What kind of body do they come? Wow, what does that mean? What kind of body do they come? In other words, you know, what's their body going to look like, okay, once they are resurrected? There's, he's like, okay, so they maybe died a very gruesome death or they are burned to death. And what's Jesus going to do? Take some duct tape and duct tape this all together and resurrect the body. That's kind of gruesome. We're going to have like the day of the living dead type of thing. Now, sounds kind of funny, but maybe that was kind of their image. They thought that, uh, so this dead body, this old and decrepit, and you know, you had an eight-year-old that died and they're, they're just a bag of bones. And what the heck is that going to look like? How crazy is that? And Paul's like, oh, good grief. <laughs> you people are so dumb. All right, so he goes on. Fool. Yes, he uses the word fool. All right, fool. What you sow doesn't come to life unless 
it dies. This is, a, this is a word that we hear from Paul multiple times where he talks about um, out of death comes life. And of course, this is the image of, of baptism, isn't it? What's baptism? Baptism isn't just a simple washing away of our, our dirt on our bodies with the waters of baptism. No, baptism is a death. You know, it's that, like that old story of the, uh, the woman being baptized at the river. And, of course, the pastor takes her and dunks her. In, before he takes her in water, he says, Do you believe? She says, I believe. And he dips her in the water. I baptize you in the name of the Father. He pulls her out. Do you believe? I believe. Do you ba I baptize you in the name of the Son. Dumps her in the water again. Pulls her back out. Do you believe? I believe. He dumps her in water again. I baptize you in the name of the Holy Spirit. He pulls her out. He says, what is it that you believe? She says, I believe you're trying to drown me. There you go, right? Uh, yes, that's exactly what baptism is. Jesus is drowning us and killing us. Not just washing a little dirt away. Killing us so that something brand new can be raised up. This is a continuous theme in Paul. And here he uses a differing image. Again, the image of the seed. And this is where we get uh, this idea that you plant the seed and it dies and it raises again. They, they didn't understand biology. Okay, we know that's not exactly what happens. But this is how Paul was communicating it. So don't, don't take in his description a description of biology like people do when they read, I don't know, Genesis 1. I don't understand why people can read Genesis 1 and say, this must be literalistically the way the world was created 10,000 years ago in, in six literalistic 24-hour periods of time and blah, 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 but then they run across this and they don't insist that we hold to a literalistic interpretation of a seed having to die. We know biology. We know this isn't how it happens, but this is just an image that Paul is using from what they understood happened to a seed. You plant it there, it shrivels up and dies and somehow plants in the earth something that raises up to something brand new. I, I you know, it's okay. We, we don't have to accept Paul's understanding of biology to believe what he was trying to communicate. So this seed is planted in the earth. It transforms into something brand new. This is what Paul is trying to say. We are buried, therefore, in baptism with Christ into death. So as he was raised from the dead, we too might be raised in newness of life. We are a seed that is planted into the ground. We die and are raised up to something brand new. This is what Paul is trying to say. So this body, it will decay. It will get old. It will become a bag of bones. It will be buried in the ground. But it will also be resurrected and transformed into something brand new. This is what Paul says. So, as for what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. So you bury it. That's not what it's going to look like when it comes back out. So this is not how I'm going to look when I'm resurrected. For the 90-year-old, his body is old. And it struggles with, maybe, uh, with arthritis. With other types of diseases. Those are going to be gone. It was just a seed. It's a seed that prepares for what is to come. It's a way that Paul is communicating uh, what will be. Remember... Don't take this literalistically. All right? It's an image that this body is not all that there is. God is going to do something new. He goes on. Not all flesh is alike. There is one flesh for human beings, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. Okay, this is actually verse 39, and part we're not supposed to read because it's a little bit confusing, but just hear it out. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one thing, that of the earthly is another. There's another glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, 
Indeed, stars differ from star in glory. Basically saying that this body is limited in nature, but there's something better waiting for us, okay? Something new is waiting for us. We will be resurrected. But the body will be new. It'll be different. And so, how does he, what does he use? He uses a particular word to describe what this body is going to be in comparison to the other one. Okay? So it is with the resurrection, verse 42 now, of the dead. What is sown is perishable, this body, this bag of bones. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. Well, <laughs> Okay, because we are filled with sin, but God says there's something more than this to us. It is raised a spiritual body. Okay. This is where I caution you. Because I always say that the Bible's image is not that we are disembodied spirits. This is the way some Christians talk about it. We die and our spirits go to heaven. And there's a separation between the body and the spirit. There's, this is not what Paul is trying to say. It is a spiritual body. He's using, to try, he's using that word as a way to describe it as different than the materialistic body in which we live. However, we're not disembodied spirits wandering around in heaven. There's no uh, life outside of this a body of some sort, okay? It's a resurrected body. It's different than the one that we leave behind. It doesn't have the word. It, it, it's resurrected for life with God, okay? But it is resurrected and made new. And it comes from the elements and from the bodies that we, we've left behind, buried in the ground. God resurrects us, makes us spiritual bodies, makes it something that will stand the test of time and eternity with God. But make no mistake, we don't live, in fact, this is, this is a theological point too that Paul is trying to make, we don't live an eternal life, ah. we live a resurrected life, okay? The difference is, is there will be a day when I die, I will not live forever. I am going to die. There will be an end to this life, but God won't forget about me. <laughs> Not even death itself will separate me from God. This is what Paul is saying. God is going to care enough for me to resurrect me. This is <clears throat> kind of, pardon me, this is <clears throat> something a relative new, relatively new innovation or thought process and Jewish way of thinking. Probably mentioned this last week where um, Jews up until uh, um, the Babylonian captivity and after the Babylonian captivity believed that when you died, you were dead, you were gone, you were never coming back. Your hope was that you had a good life and were able to pass your seed on to the next generation. That your quiver would be filled with arrows that would go into the future. And that's how God perpetuated your lineage and God blessed you. So Abraham certainly did not believe that he was going to have a resurrected life. Moses did not believe that he would have a resurrected life. When he was dead, he was gone. His hope was the legacy he left behind that would go into the future. But at some point, Jewish thinking transformed and God revealed to them that there was more than just this life. There was resurrected life. Who did that come through? Through the Pharisees, by the way. We always think of the Pharisees as the punching bag of Jesus. They were, as I mentioned last week, they were goodly, godly people who guided the nation of Israel through some difficult, challenging times. Now, the Pharisees that Jesus dealt with, they were punks, okay? All desirous of power and control. 
But through much of the history of Pharisaism, they introduced, again, many of the new teachings that, uh, that we cling to to this day, including this concept of resurrection. They were the ones that introduced this idea that God had something more for us than just this life. Okay? Uh, but again, the emphasis on resurrection. We don't live an eternal life. Well, I know the Bible will say that, but it's all frame of reference. From your resurrection, it will be eternal after that. But we live a resurrected life. We die, and then we are resurrected. We don't die, our disembodied spirits go to heaven. We die, and we are resurrected. This is the point that Paul is trying to make. And it's all because of what Jesus has done. JC, there you go. He's the motivating factor. Paul, again, remembers arguing for the uniqueness of this Christian sect. That's the way it was viewed at that time, called Christianity. Sectarianism. It's a sect of Judaism. That's what was considered a branch off of Judaism at that time. Okay, so let's go on. Let's finish this up here. So I hope we've gotten some good information, but let's keep going on. So we were on verse 45. Thus it is risen, written, the first man, Adam. Now, unfortunately, again, we're, we're being introduced to this here. Paul's already introduced this in a section that we didn't read that was excerpted from our reading here for the lectionary. Thus it is written, the first Adam... So Paul's making a comparison now. So we've got resurrected life, a brand new body, the first Adam. Who was the first Adam? Uh, Adam, right. Okay. The first Adam, who, which by the way, the name Adam means man of dust. Yes, Adam. Man of dust. This is written. The first man became a living being. The last Adam, there's a last Adam? I already mentioned this. Uh, Sunday school answer again. Who's the last Adam? Oh, that's right, Jesus. You know, these are like prototypes. It's again, it's an image. The last man of dust, Jesus, did something brand new. Okay, the last Adam became a life giving spirit. Okay? So he overcame his nature as a person of dust. But it is not the spiritual that is first, the physical, then the spiritual. Okay. So the, the, we are physical beings, materialistic beings. Out of this, God resurrects something brand new. It is not the spiritual first. Oh, the, verse 47. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. There you go. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are those who are, are of dust, you and me. And as is the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. So we're born people of dust who die. We are reborn. This is how we're born. We're born a person of dust. We are reborn. Many images that Paul uses, inheritors of the kingdom of heaven, Children of God, okay, spiritual beings. It's acknowledgement again that we are more than what meets the eye. As was the man of dust, so are those who are of dust. As is the man of heaven, so are those of heaven. Verse 49, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also now bear the image. We'll be reborn of the man of heaven. We will be like Jesus. That's spectacular. So what I'm saying, brothers, this is how Paul ends this section that we're reading. What I'm saying to you, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven, nor does the perishable inherit the perishable. Okay, so he's basically saying that again. Um, don't look at this body. And this is, was a criticism. Remember what the criticism that we were making. So you're saying that nine-year-old grandmother of mine whose bodies were racked with arthritis is going to... 
What type of life? She's going to be resurrected and that's what she's got to live with for eternity? That's crazy. Paul's saying, you dingbats. We are resurrected. This is just, this is a seed. And out of the seed, God produces something that will be able to live with him out of for eternity. We will be resurrected something brand new. We die on our raised to newness of life. Isn't it fantastic? I want you again to remember that Paul just uses multiple different images to communicate the exact same thing. And what are they? They're images. Don't get lost in all of the details with Paul. We know that Paul's understanding of biology is insufficient and lacks scientific knowledge. It's okay. It's just the image that he's trying to communicate to us that's important. And so he tries to communicate this as a seed. He communicates it in terms of baptism. Many different images that Paul uses to communicate the same thing. That we die in Christ, but you're raised to newness of life. Because in Christian theology, the most important thing, resurrection. Oh, that's the season to come, right? Lent followed by that grand seven-week season, a week of weeks, 49 days, that we celebrate called Easter. And we look forward to that celebration too. All right, well, I hope this is encouraging. Um, you know, we always read in, in Paul's lesson at the gravesite of many who are buried, you know, people who have uh, literally lost their mind near the end of their life, maybe because of Alzheimer's. I, I, and again, I'm not, you know, this happens where people are uh, no longer the person that you recognized, or they're physically just so decrepit. You, may, you remember them as a young person, how they love to dance or run or do all of these things. They're so energetic and, uh, when they're younger, and then all of that is taken from them, and, and we just sit there and say, what, what in the world? That, but Paul reminds us, we will have a resurrected body. That person who is dancing as a young man or woman will be dancing again in the kingdom of heaven. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for just a vision of your kingdom. The reminder that again we will live with you. Our loved ones will be with you. These bodies will no longer be a limitation. Right now, they're a limitation. They're susceptible to all sorts of decay, aches and pains, frustrations. But we know that in our death, there is always newness of life. You never leave anyone behind. And for that, we give thanks. So let us have our hope in you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.